In 2011 in Sacramento, California, a mother came round after an epileptic seizure to discover her baby daughter lying next to her, unresponsive and badly burned. However, what appeared to be a tragic accident turned into something far more sinister when investigators discovered a melted baby's dummy in the microwave oven. This is what happens when the line between genuine illness and cold-blooded murder become blurred. This is the case of Ka Yang. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case, I hope that it's going to cause you some conflict, because I think it should. But I also hope that you can potentially find some empathy. And at the end of the day, in saying all of that, remember the true victim here. If you're new to my channel and you've just stumbled across me and you're thinking, what is she going on about? Well, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. If you like crime and consistency, this is a channel for you. I never, ever miss a time or a date and will not add infinitum until, I don't know, they hold my funeral service on YouTube. Also, thanks to everyone who's a returner. You know that you keep my channel going. For those of you who subscribe to my Patreon and my YouTube membership, thank you. I cannot make this content without you. It's quite exhausting, it's exhaustive, and it's also incredibly important to me that I do the justice of the victims, the justice they deserve, which means that it takes a lot of work, but it's absolutely joyful, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, it's such a trial, it's quite the contrary. I absolutely adore you, I adore this channel, and I adore the support that you give me, so thank you so much. So let's go back to 2011, this is where the crime plays out. We've got 29-year-old Ka Yang. She's a mother of three, she's living in Sacramento, California with her husband, Chai Lo. He's a long-distance lorry driver. They've also got four children, including three young sons, aged four, seven and eight, and she also has a baby daughter. Now, Yang, of Hmong descent, she was born in the US and the family are practicing Mormons, so quite a religious background. Now, Yang's youngest daughter was a one-month-old called Mirabel Tolo, and she'd been born on the 22nd of January, 2011. She was a child by all accounts, and there are many accounts, that Yang absolutely cherished. She'd already got three boys, so she was absolutely delighted when Mirabel came along. She'd been trying for a daughter for two years, and all of her family, all of her friends, they knew her was a really loving and caring mother. She was somebody who was very devoted to her children. There were no questions about that, up until the point that we're gonna cover shortly. Now, Chai's brother, Valo, he actually also lived with the family, and Yang's mother, Chu Aku Yang, she also stayed with them from time to time to help out. Chi was often away with work during the week. He could be gone with two weeks at a time and other family members actually live quite nearby. So she was somebody who had a lot of support and also they were quite a connected family. So when Yang needed help, help was available. Whilst she was pregnant, Yang had actually worked in an office but then following Mirabelle's birth, because she wanted to keep money coming in, she worked part-time for a local architectural firm and her job there mainly was involving preparing checks online. But essentially the family have really got it together. There's a lot of support there. She seems like a devoted parent. Her husband loves her, her family love her. And when she needs the occasional additional support, people are quick to create it. Now, from the age of around 13, something had happened to Yang physiologically and she started to endure some pretty difficult times because she suffered from epileptic seizures. From the ages of 13 to 29, she suffered in excess of 100 of those seizures during her life. And as with lots of epileptic seizures, when they actually occur, there's typically no warning and she would describe it as there was almost like a flash and that flash would signal the beginning of one of these seizures. She'd fall to the ground and 
she'd lose consciousness. Also, because of what was going on within her body within that seizure, her hands would curl up, her limbs would shake, and also her eyes were seen to roll back into her head. She'd also often be seen drooling, she'd make moaning noises, and typically she would bite her tongue, and also she'd sometimes lose control of her bladder. Now these seizures are technically known as generalized onset seizures and they would last between five and 10 minutes at a time. Once it came back and she was present again, she would be very weak, she'd be very disorientated, very confused. And also she genuinely wouldn't remember what had happened. She'd also feel really tired, very lethargic. I mean, it's a really big impact on the body. It's shocking, it's scary. As I've just described, it can cause an injury and it must be very disconcerting to go through that. And then to come around confused, disorientated, unsure of where you are, that's very upsetting. And people said that she was unable to even follow simple directions, certainly wasn't able to undertake any complex tasks. Hold on to that memory because that's gonna play out down the line when we're analyzing what happened and whether it was possible to have happened the way that it's been described. So very often when she was confused afterwards, even the simplest of tasks were beyond her. Also, if paramedics were called because she was seen to have one of these fits and people didn't know what was going on and emergency services arrived, she really struggled to answer even simple questions. And she'd even be very confused as to why they were there. She was so disorientated, she really didn't understand what was going on. And it could take anything from 30 minutes to several hours to even get her head around what had happened. And depending on the seriousness of the seizure, that time could be longer. But understandably, there's a huge trauma with an event like that to the body. Now, aside from these really large seizures, Yang would also experience minor ones, which are called minor fast seizures. Now, technically, they're known as complex partial seizures. So this is when she kind of stiffened, her face would go blank, but then after a few minutes, she'd come back to her senses. She wouldn't know what had been going on, but essentially she'd return to the present almost like she just completely checked out, but they didn't go on for anywhere near the length or didn't have the impact of the ones that I've described previously. Also in the past, she'd actually had a seizure while she was driving and she'd woken up remembering nothing. So you can imagine how terrifying that is. You know, you're driving one minute and the next minute you're waking up in hospital and you've got no idea what had played out. Also, she took medication, which you'd expect because they were trying desperately to control these seizures, but in her mind, she didn't really believe that the medication was particularly effective. So I suppose we can grasp from that that her personal experience was that it didn't make a big difference to the seizures. So we get to the 17th of March, 2011. This starts off as a genuinely ordinary day, like any other working day whatsoever. So as usual, Yang's husband's away, he's driving. Her mother, Chua, she'd actually come around the previous night. She was staying to help out with the childcare because she needed some help that afternoon. And Yang had actually planned to sort out her benefits application, which is why obviously having the help was gonna be really useful. So initially she woke up around 5 a.m. in the morning. She got up, fed Mirabel. We all know when we have a baby that they wake up very early because they are constantly hungry. So she reacts to that perfectly. And then she goes online, completes a bit of work from her bed, gets up around 7 a.m., changes Mirabel because she'd been crying. So she obviously tends to her needs. And then her mum, she takes care of her from that point because apparently Yang needed to go out to sort out an errand. At this point, her sons are playing video games. Then after Yang returns, her mother then takes the two eldest boys to school. And this is so that she can have a bit of time to prepare breakfast for her youngest son. And then after her mum returns, she goes out into the garden to do some gardening. So Yang leaves Mirabelle on a pillow on the floor. And classic experience of anybody with siblings, at one stage the youngest boy is actually playing with her daughter 
and he, she notices that he's being a bit rough with Mirabelle. So Yang scolds him for actually playing too roughly. And I think that's really important to introduce because clearly we are seeing a mother who's concerned about the welfare of her child. She's certainly not neglectful. She's keeping an eye on her little girl, even though she's trying to get on with some tasks and she's protective of her. So when her little boy gets a little bit too rough and tumble, there is a consequence to that behavior. Now her son then goes and gets ready for school and at this point Mirabelle is placed into a bouncy chair. We've all used those as mums haven't we and dads? We've all had the bouncy chair. Just put them in a bouncy chair, they'll bounce up and down and smile and laugh a lot. It's helpful, you can still keep an eye on them and they can't go and hurt themselves anywhere in the home. And this is so typical what I'm describing, there's so many families experience, this just seems like the archetypal normal morning. Now, meanwhile, Yang gets on with her work and her mother cooks some breakfast. So we're seeing the routine experience of a very well-connected family. Now, later down the line that morning, Chi calls Yang, this is during a break from his driving job, and they actually speak for at least an hour. Apparently this was quite common, but again, I think that is very notable because Sometimes people who are in relationships with children don't get to speak for five minutes because, you know, they want a little bit of space and peace. And there's something really connected, isn't there, about the fact that Chi and Yang spend nearly an hour on the phone and it's a normality in their lives. Now, he remembers that Mirabelle was being fussier than usual that day. Apparently, she was crying quite a lot. She didn't settle easily. But, you know, at the end of the day, Yang has been through this several times. She's got three sons. She will be well used to this kind of behaviour. And Chi recalled that when he spoke to Yang, genuinely, she didn't sound stressed. She didn't sound frustrated. They just had an ordinary conversation. And they actually get off the phone from each other around noon that day or just before noon. And it's around the same time that that call ends that Chi's brother Va walks Yang's youngest son to school, returning 20 minutes later and then just going up to his room. At 1.55 p.m. he then goes and collects the two older boys from school and before he leaves he actually notices Yang's working at a computer. So then between the hours of 1 and 2, Yang basically works on lots of multiple online checks, so she's doing a job, and this is all time frame, so we're very aware of exactly what plays out that day. And she was only left alone with Mirabelle after Val leaves at 1.55 p.m. And bear in mind at this moment in time, her mother is continuing work in the garden. So her computer records that she worked on an online check at 1.58 p.m. Now, whilst Yang is alone with one-month-old Mirabelle, she gives the baby her dummy pacifier to calm her down. She gives her a bottle so that she's calm. And apparently during this period of time, at one point, she notices that Mirabelle's eyes are moving from side to side. And it was as if she felt at the time that Mirabelle's eyes were actually following something that potentially she could see something that Yang couldn't see, but obviously she's looking around and thinking, well, there's nothing there. But it really concerns her a little bit. It kind of gets her hackles up and scares her. So Yang ultimately decides to pick Mirabelle up and she stops crying. Now down the line, Yang would claim that while she's alone with the baby and while she's holding her at the computer, she begins to experience the onset of a seizure. So her head started pounding and then she sees a bright flash. So it's very contextual to the usual kind of episode we've described before. But when she awakes, as expected, she can't remember anything. So immediately she just presumes, oh, I've had a seizure and she'd bitten her tongue and she'd wet herself. So that's in fitting with how we've described prior episodes that we're looking at right now. So the last thing that she apparently remembers, she was holding Mirabelle. But then when she actually comes around, she's horrified because she realises that her daughter is now lying next to her on the floor. And even more harrowing is she looks at her daughter's physical appearance and her face is really red. She's really stiff. And the most concerning of all is she isn't breathing. Now she's terrified. So she instinctively just goes to find her mum, 
because at the end of the day, she wants to ask her for assistance and probably reassure her. You always think about those people in your life that are going to be able to help you in those moments. And for her, it's a mum. Now, bear in mind, she's been in the garden. She's actually making her way inside at that moment in time from working in the garden. And as the mum reaches the steps, she just sees Yang and she notices that she looks distressed and she's holding the baby. And she can see that her daughter's sweating and her face is really flushed. And she looks at her and she appears to have wet herself. Pants were wet around the thighs. Also, another thing she appears to have done is to have bitten her tongue and she can't string a sentence together properly. Now, her mum can see that something is clearly also wrong with Mirabel. So straight away, she unzips the baby's pajama top and it's just the most harrowing thing. It's incomprehensible because her mother's been in the garden, she's seen her daughter, everything's been okay, and all of a sudden she's unzipping the pajama top and this little baby's torso is covered in burns, but not just covered in burns, it's actually hot to the touch and her skin is peeling off. And Yang starts to peel a piece of skin from Mirabelle's chest and her mother actually slaps her hand away to stop her is that instinct of, no, no, you can't do that. That'll damage her further. She then takes Mirabelle from Yang and then walks inside. And I can't even imagine the confusion that her mother would be going through psychologically in that moment. Now, shortly after, Var actually arrives home because he's been collecting the older boys from school. And when he enters the house, obviously he encounters Yang and her mum and her mum's holding Mirabelle near the door and instantly Yang could see there is something seriously wrong with this baby. And her mother then says, because obviously she's been figuring out how on earth has this happened? Why is this child burnt? What is going on? So she says to him, maybe what has happened is that Yang's had a seizure, dropped Mirabelle and fallen on her. Now, at this point, obviously, Var is just blindsided and is thinking, we should not be discussing any of this. All we need to do is to take Mirabelle to hospital. But Char actually says to him, no, let's call an ambulance because they want to get them there at ASAP. He does that at 2.09 p.m. Now, bear in mind, all of that that's happened, that was less than 15 minutes after Var had left Yang alone with Mirabelle. So he is going into some other reality, isn't he? He's like, what on earth has played out since I left? Everything was fine. It was a normal day. She was working on the computer. There is nothing that has occurred that could explain any of what he's watching unfold in front of his eyes right now. Now, during the call, when he speaks to the dispatcher, he's saying what he believes has happened because obviously it's kind of been passed on to him. And they explained that as far as they can gather, because they weren't witnesses, but as far as they can gather and make sense of, Yang suffered a seizure, dropped her baby, and basically then fallen on her. And that explains why the baby wasn't breathing. So Var relayed the dispatcher's instructions, obviously to Yang, to ensure that the baby is getting the best chance of survival, if that's possible. So Yang then follows these instructions. She places Mirabelle on the couch and she goes ahead and performs mouth to mouth. At the same time, Va performs chest compressions. And one of the things that really stood out for Va is that he's struggling to understand how this is a normal experience of Yang enduring a seizure because he's used to the signs. You know, she's had a lot of them. He's been present in these situations. He's aware of what plays out and he doesn't feel that it's following the same continuum. So the usual signs that he associates with her having a particular episode just don't seem to be present. But again, bear in mind this is a really shocking episode so we wouldn't expect people to behave in the way that they would ordinarily behave. Even, shall we say, if they were usually unable to even have conversations and then find themselves in a distressing place where maybe adrenaline is coursing through their situation and system that maybe they would be more capable of those conversations because of that situation. I'm just suggesting a possibility. I'm not saying that's factual, just adding a potential as to why she wasn't necessarily acting in the way that she had done previously. Now, it only takes about five minutes after this for the emergency services to actually arrive. 
So they are going to take over. A fireman takes over the CPR. And obviously, they're now trying to assess what on earth has happened. So he says, you know, how has this occurred? So Yang now claims that she'd suffered a seizure and she'd dropped Mirabelle on an electric space heater. So at that moment in time, what she's done is accommodated why her daughter is burnt. And yes, that's a change of story. Initially, she thinks that she's literally fallen on the baby and the baby has potentially stopped breathing because she suffocated her in that way. But obviously, she's now realising that the skin is peeling off and she's thinking to herself, how on earth has that happened potentially? And then there is a space heater and she's imagining, okay, well, if I dropped her on there, that would explain the burns. Now, like Var, the fireman struggled to see that she'd actually had a seizure. So there are a few things that concerned him. First of all, she was very calm and alert. She was standing, she was talking, she was making eye contact. Also, she didn't appear confused, but just to again, play devil's advocate with that mindset and that description. Is it natural if your daughter is dead and burnt within your care to be calm? To me, the very fact that she seems calm is a juxtaposition to how we'd expect her to feel. And bear in mind, only a short while earlier, she'd been chastising her son, who was being a little bit rough and tumble with Mirabelle. So the idea that she would be calm at a moment of chaos, confusion and distress, I personally think that that would suggest that something was going on within her because that is not a normal reaction. So we have these conflicting ideas of what's played out and when the fireman looks at Mirabelle, my God, her injuries are just horrific. So she is basically unresponsive. She's burnt from head to foot. But one of the things that really stands out is the pajamas, the hair, nothing's singed. Her body is burnt badly, but there aren't any soot marks or charring marks or hair that shrivel because of the capture of fire or the heat. And this is really unusual. So then we get to a quarter of an hour later and understandably the police arrive at the property. Of course they do because the child has died in mysterious circumstances and it's tragically at this point that Mirabelle's pronounced dead, which is just absolutely heinous beyond belief. You can't imagine, can you, for the members of the family being in a situation where in a very short amount of time, a normal day has become extraordinarily dark and life has changed forever because that's what's happened right now. Life has changed forever. Now, an officer, they interview Yang at the scene, and obviously she's explaining, well, I have a history of seizures, and that I'd suffered a seizure just before you came. That's why this has happened. The situation has played out where I didn't know what was happening, I didn't know what I was doing, and this is the result. Now, she also says, look, I don't know what happened exactly, but the only thing I can put together is that I dropped Mirabelle at the onset of the seizure, I dropped her onto the space heater, and this is what's caused the awful burns. Now, again, the officer who's questioning her says that, first of all, she understood the questions. So she isn't struggling to comprehend what he's asking, and she's able to formulate a reaction and an answer. So she appears quite calm, she is understanding the situation and she's able to return answers that the officer is actually asking her to return. Again, I do think that's quite strange, don't get me wrong, I appreciate that in prior experiences of her seizures she is very confused, disorientated and needs to go and lie down for a long period of time, but equally calmness in a scenario like this, does not fit the context. And we're not talking about this woman being a prior psychopath who everybody is expecting this kind of behavior to come from. We're talking about a woman who is reactionary in a positive way towards her children. Would she actually be calm in these circumstances? Even if she had caused harm to her child, would she be acting in this way? Now, the officer, with respect, did think that maybe it was just shock 
And I think that's, again, a very clear and reasonable suggestion that she isn't operating in a normal way. Now, one of the things that he didn't do is he didn't check her clothing, but he said he couldn't smell urine. Now, again, this could just be me, but I've had babies and I've also been around people when they've been having a bit of a bad night out and I've been in situations where people have wet themselves and the reality is fresh urine doesn't smell. It really doesn't. It takes a little bit of time to soak in and as it starts to dry out, you'll get that smell. But I don't think immediately you're going to be drawn to a stronger smell of urine unless that person is heavily dehydrated because arguably it won't come across as that kind of stench. But also when the officers do a search of the property, they can't actually find the obvious source for how the baby has been burned. So they're obviously thinking it's not in contest with what she's saying. Now on the face of it, it did seem to all of them involved, even though they were like a little bit unsure about some of the scenarios that were being suggested, they kind of felt like Yang's version of events was plausible. So a woman who literally loved and cherished her children had just gone through the most tragic of experiences, you know, she'd been stood there doing everything right and then all of a sudden she experienced this epileptic seizure and she's holding a baby at the time. In that moment where she loses control of everything, she drops the baby onto an electric space heater and unfortunately that baby suffers catastrophic burns and dies. Now, of course, when that happened, no one was in the house. So literally no one could help them in the interim. And they're processing this. And of course, it's so sad because if a brother-in-law had been early or a mother had walked in before, then hopefully this could have been avoided, but it hadn't been. And that's the way that everyone is looking at it. That basically Mirabelle just missed out on the sliding doors moment of being saved because unfortunately, the way this played out meant that she was sadly killed before people who would have saved her in a heartbeat had the chance to do that. And it was obvious, even to the first responders, that what had killed her were the terrible burns and those injuries that she'd been afflicted by during that process. Now, the only question mark when they're kind of exploring this and coming to those conclusions is Yang's state immediately after the incident because normally she's in a very confused, very lethargic state, often has to go and lie down. But in this case, she did come across as really coherent and really calm. So that's causing them a little bit of suspicion. Even members of her own family are thinking, this isn't how it usually plays out. But wow, the suspicions about her version of events are gonna increase dramatically shortly. Because as the officers are going around the house, one of them discovered something in the kitchen. In the microwave oven was a melted pacifier. Now, as horrific as it is to even begin to imagine, what the officers now suspected was that Mirabelle's fatal burns hadn't been caused by an accident involving an electric space heater but rather had been intentionally caused with a microwave. And I think that for any of you who have heated up food using a microwave, the thermal reaction within that, it heats from the inside out. So that would also clearly explain why the hair and why the clothes weren't charred, because basically it works in a completely different way where the heating is concerned. And also, we know how quickly microwaves heat things up. The idea that a baby had lost their lives, that a baby had endured the agonizing pain that would have occurred being microwaved is something that is almost incalculable for our brains to try to manage. The idea that that child endured that is astonishingly devastating. So when the pathologist brings out the results, they subsequently determined that Mirabelle had died of thermal injuries, and those thermal injuries had occurred by overexposure to microwave radiation in a microwave oven. 
he found that 56% of a body had suffered second and third degree burns. And of course, she'd also suffered really high level internal burns. The most serious burn was a radiation burn that literally penetrated her internal organs. So how do I put it? It had cooked her, genuinely. It had cooked her through to her stomach and small intestines. It's just mind boggling to even begin to get your head around what I've just said. Now, they were able to establish that the burn patterns were actually consistent with Mirabelle being placed in the oven lengthwise on her back. And that little baby's last moments would have been intensely painful. There's no way of hiding that. It would have been horrific. The exposure that she was put under to those radiation waves and the intense heat, she would have lived her last moments out in agony. Now, when they looked at how long she had been put in that microwave oven, they brought in an expert and they said that it must have been for at least five minutes. And the fatal injuries, so the things that actually killed her, they would have lasted at least two to three minutes. But the severe burns that were actually seen, the peeling of the skin, etc., from the exterior, that would have taken longer. Now, to set the timer for that long, it isn't as simple as just pressing the start button. We've all done that. I'm sure that most of you have got microwaves and there's that 30 second one that you can use, which is just a start timer. For the rest, we mostly have to program them. So you use multiple buttons and the quickest method actually they worked out on that particular microwave was you would have pressed baked potato twice and then you'd have pressed the start button. So that's the quickest, it's three different strokes. And this is a problem. As far as the investigators are concerned, Yang's claims seem to be at odds with what actually has played out because by her own admission, she's usually very confused. She can't follow simple sentences. She often has to lie down and she certainly can't carry out complex actions. This has already been noted about Yang's behavior after one of these episodes. So that lends itself to ask the question, you know, how did you operate a microwave in that way? So not just a simple press button, but actually putting a child lay down in it, closing the door, setting a timer potentially for a baked potato for five minutes when you said that you had this seizure and you lost consciousness and then you came around and didn't know anything. So they're really concerned now and thinking, this story isn't adding up. Now they interview her again later the same day and you can imagine that for a mother who's just lost her little girl who is much wanted, she is not going to be in a normal mental state. Add to that the potential that she has had a seizure, let's just throw that in there that she has had a seizure, then her brain is not going to be operating in the way that it should. Yang at this point is still insisting, look I had a seizure, she said that she'd bitten a tongue, she said that she'd lost control of her bladder, but the officers didn't actually notice at this point that her pants were wet or that she smelled of urine. And I guess I lend more credibility to that situation now because some period of time has passed, so it should be drying. But again, if you are dehydrated, your urine will smell real bad. But if you are not, then there is a strong likelihood it won't be too odorous. Then they asked to look at her tongue, but they can't see any fresh injuries on it. And that's obviously a problem because allegedly that's one of the markers telling her that she's definitely had one of these episodes because she's wet herself and she's bitten through her tongue. She's then asked by the investigators, did you put Mirabelle in the microwave? And she said, no, of course I didn't. But when she's asked, could you have done it during a seizure? She just says, listen, I can never remember what happens at these times. And let's be honest, that is contextual, that's correct. She's woken up in hospital after having a seizure in a car and had no recollection of any of it. So that is something that's in line with what she's talked about. And another thing that she's absolutely adamant about is, listen, I've had 100 seizures. I have never, ever hurt anyone during a seizure. That doesn't even stay in context with my own experience of the past with these episodes. She then adds to them, listen, I wasn't even in a bad mood. I wasn't frustrated with Mirabelle that day. 
Yes, she was crying. Yes, she wouldn't settle down. But I had an hour conversation with my husband. My mother was available. My brother-in-law was available. This was not a situation where I was out of hand with my child. Now, what the police did say was at times she appeared confused by some of the questions. And that would play into how she's been before. So confusion is a part of what occurs for her. So the fact that the police officers are noticing this, that would be contextual with her prior experiences. And the detectives actually say to her, look, we think you should go and see a doctor. And then when she was asked about where she was going to go to see a doctor, she actually said, it's after my seizure, my brain just keeps hurting for a couple of hours. It's um, before it gets back to normal. So she's kind of confused in that statement. She's saying it, but it's not like she's really cogent in her expression there. So Yang ends up getting interviewed again, and this time in the presence of a mum. And the detectives don't hold back. And they basically directly ask her, why did you kill your baby? Now, at this moment in time, both Yang and her mother mention spirits which is not the most ideal thing to mention in an interview with the police. And the thing about different cultures is that different people handle physiological issues differently in those cultures. So for example, in the UK, if you suffer from schizoaffective disorder and you might have delusions and hallucinations, then people will actually talk about you having psychotic breaks and it will be dealt with through medication. But in other continents, it will be that you're considered a shaman and people will actually revere you to some degree in certain places because it is different when you go to different places. When you are talking to the police, however, that can really get the hackles up and they start thinking, okay, hang on, what has this woman done? What are her main beliefs? So they obviously ask to clarify what she's going on about. And her mum and her say that she's been possessed by her seizures. So again, they're not saying that she is possessed by the devil or there is a demon within her. It's more of a descriptive episode to say that she loses control and she's no longer in control of her faculties. So then they carry on interviewing. There's another two occasions that she's interviewed and Yang just sticks to her original version of events. So she said, I collapsed when I'd have a seizure. I came round, Mirabel was injured. She said again, I was not angry. I was not frustrated by Mirabel's crying. I genuinely don't know what happened. Don't get me wrong, she conceded that she had been crying more that morning, but she said, I've never ever wanted to hurt my baby. I've never wanted to hurt anybody. But she does, during these interviews, talk about things like suicidal ideation. So when she was a teenager, she did think about taking her own life. But that was down to the fact that she was really out of control with the condition. The seizures were really upsetting her and she was looking for an exit route. It's a coping strategy. It's a permanent one. And we don't want people to take that strategy. But nonetheless, you can understand as a teenager when you think that you're going to have to go through this for the rest of your life and nothing's changing and you just want an ordinary experience like your teenage peers. It does make you stretch your imagination to possibilities of ending what you have to face. And in this case, she starts to think about suicide. Also, she said that she considered hurting herself on one occasion. But the point is, she'd never gone through with it. And she said the reason that she'd never gone through with it as she got older was for the sake of her children. So again, she can identify that her children have given her meaning and the meaning has prevented her from acting on even these difficult thoughts. Now, during a conversation at the police station with her husband, one of the things that Yang did talk about was just before her seizure, she'd noticed Mirabelle's eyes moving from side to side. And she also said that she'd seen a Caucasian demon or spirit outside the window staring in at her and Mirabelle. Now that's a very strange hallucination to experience. And she said that she believed that that particular Caucasian demon had wanted Mirabelle. She'd wanted the baby. Now, her husband later goes and clarifies this. And he says that there is a belief in Hmong culture that epilepsy is a manifestation of demonic possession. 
Now, he said he considers that absolute bullshit, but nonetheless, that to some degree has been hardwired into the psyche of Yang. So Yang then goes on to claim that the demon had made her kill her daughter. But again, when you look at that and take it verbatim and think, okay, this woman is now claiming that she's seen things and that thing has made her kill her child. Are we going down the route of insanity? Or, oh, she's finding an excuse now using a psychotic break to explain her actions. It's not as simple as that. Because what her husband and actually what Yang is saying is that she felt possessed by the seizure at the time rather than an actual demon. But you can imagine the interpretation is potentially lost on the investigators. They've heard these kind of excuses before. And this is the problem when somebody has a completely different cultural experience and identity than you do, because you have a bias to interpret it the way that you think and the way that you may have experienced previously. So we get to April 2011. And this is during an interview with an employee from Child Protective Services. Yang basically said, look, I went blank. You know, I was working at the computer and then I awoke in my bed and I was with Mirabelle. And then she also went on to say that she'd seen a black shadow moving through the house. Now it's really confusing and I've tried to think this through because obviously her story's changed a little bit and also, we're just referencing what we think Yang may have meant. Because in some instances, it does feel like she's making some distinction between spirits and demons and her seizures. But at other points, it does seem like she's actually talking about seeing demons and shadows. But again, I'm just going to state that this could just be a cultural misunderstanding. It could, of course to just play devil's advocate, be a deliberate attempt to muddy the waters and to further confuse matters, that's also a possibility. Now, due to all of these inconsistencies and claims that the investigators are very quick to point out, Yang then goes on to change her story. And I think that this is a real problem, isn't it? Because you can be confused, you can not necessarily make sense of how things have played out and you can stick to that story even if there are holes within it and even though people may think that there are some problems with it often because you're quite clear it will seem relatively truthful you might add bits you might forget bits that's really normal but you kind of stay with the claims that you initially make but Yang ends up changing her story and she basically admits that she'd lied about the seizure and also lied about Mirabel being burned by an electric space heater, which is a major detraction from what I've been telling you so far. So at this point, she actually says, maybe I've got a split personality. Now, for those of you who understand the old terminology, split personality would now be diagnosed as DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. And I will tell you now that there is a lot of debate in the psychological community regarding whether it's real or otherwise, but nonetheless, this is what she is talking about. So that would still cause, at times, a break from reality where she was not potentially aware of the personality that had taken over and had carried out this killing, shall we say. But what it does is it undermines everything that she's said so far, and that makes her look like a liar. So at this point, Yang's charged with her daughter's first degree murder. She immediately says she's not guilty. And it does actually seem at this point that she changes the defence back to claims of an epileptic seizure. It's hard to know what brought her to this point. I am somebody who thinks that when you're being interrogated repeatedly, you can get to a point where you start to concede that you will agree with whatever the interrogator is suggesting to you. 
I'm not saying she's innocent of these charges. A child has died in the most heinous of ways. But I also think it's really important to explore the reality and possibility that when you've not been involved in the criminal justice system and then you are constantly being interrogated by individuals who believe that they know what happened and might have a bias as to your guilt as far as they're suggesting in their heads it may be, that it's quite challenging and you can sometimes start to almost breathe in their biases and start to own it. I'm not saying that's the case, I'm saying it's happened. False confessions have occurred many times, particularly when somebody is in an experience of psychological distress or loss or both. So the fact that she changes the story and says, okay, I did do it, and okay, I didn't have the seizure, it feels a little bit like that perfectly fits in contextually with what the investigators and interrogators want her to say. And it could be that in the end she just gives in and says it. And then when the defence gets hold of this, they're like, you didn't need to say this, just stick to the truth. And if her truth is I had a seizure and this happened when I was out of my mind, they're going to go with that because it sticks in context with everything she said before. Now initially, a medical expert for the prosecution actually advised that a murder charge shouldn't be pursued. He actually said, listen, I do think that Yang could have put Mirabelle in the microwave in an unconscious state. She suffered a seizure, she went ahead and did that, and these are the consequences. However, when they do, I suppose, a deeper analysis of the timeline that's involved, he actually retracts his recommendation and he said that Yang couldn't have made a complex entry into her computer at 1.58 p.m., then had a seizure, then put Mirabelle in the microwave for five minutes in a confused state and performed a series of complex button presses in correct order before then bringing her baby to her mother at 2.09 p.m., and then apparently become coherent just a few minutes later. So because of her medical history, the experts who would look at that history would have expected her to still be on the floor for about five to 10 minutes after the seizure, and then that she'd be in a real confused state for at least half an hour. And of course, according to the emergency responders, this hadn't been the case. Now, the medical expert for the defense, they didn't agree. Obviously, the defence and prosecution very rarely agree. But they said, look, Yang suffered from multiple types of seizure, including partial seizures. And during partial seizures, people can get up, they can perform a learned task in a very confused state, such as operating a microwave, and they can also recover within about one to three minutes. However, that expert, rightly so, absolutely 100%, rightly conceded that it'd be really rare for a mother to put her baby in a microwave in such a state. I think for the prosecution to be saying that there is absolutely no way this would ever happen, there is no way it's in context with her prior history, they are missing out those more minor seizures and that for a jury is something that is going to challenge them because they're going to be thinking, how the hell would you put a baby in a microwave? And I think that if I was on the jury, I myself would be struggling. I'd be thinking, no way. You know, I know what it's like to hold a baby in my arms. I know having to push them into a microwave would be quite difficult. I cannot even compute for a second that that is a possibility. And I think that if I was a jury, I'd probably be in a situation where you would have to literally turn water into wine to get me to think any differently from that perspective. But when you listen to the other expert, it is possible. It's unusual, it's atypical, but it is possible. But how that's gonna drown out the conscience of feeling about the fact that a baby has been microwaved is very, very challenging. Also, the part about the microwave interests me, just because I'm not the most technological person in the world. And I tend to program my microwave how I use it. So if I was somebody that was always defrosting, and I defrost just by putting things in the microwave and putting them on full heat for five minutes, I know that's not how you're meant to do it. I'm sure that my microwave has a program for doing things like a defrost. 
but it really confuses me. So I have a kind of way of using it, a method. And it would not be the first time that I have seen women, mothers, do this similarly. So it could be that that microwave is on a particular program that she just presses start with because it's the one that she uses more readily. It could be that her mother had programmed it earlier on when doing breakfast and so on and so forth. It just hadn't been started. And I'm not trying to defend her for a minute. I'm just saying that there are possibilities that that very complex way of operating wasn't really that complex at all. It might just be my own bias because I'm useless at technology and I don't know how to defrost anything. But I'm sure that some of you listening will agree. Let me know in the comments. Are you technologically like me? Could you easily set a program on a microwave that is always the one that you use and not necessarily change that way of programming or using? Now, there's also a possibility, of course, and I'm sure that some of you who've suffered from postnatal depression, your hackles will have been going up and you'll have been thinking, hey, we're missing out a really big possibility here, which is postpartum depression. Because clearly, people who have postpartum depression can develop postpartum psychosis. And it's absolutely debilitating, devastating. The onset can be quick. And you don't know who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it. You literally break from reality. But when they considered this, Yang's circumstances didn't apparently fit with those typically associated with the illness. Now, there are some stereotypes. So for example, she wasn't a teenager. It's more consistent with younger people. Also, she had really good family support. They were there, so she has access to help. She's not getting to that point of losing her mind. And I use the word losing her mind contextually, because that's how it feels when you're dealing particularly with postpartum psychosis but she's got that support there. People are coming and going. She knows that she can give responsibility to somebody else. She's already a mum of three, so she's not previously suffered. She had a planned pregnancy. She wasn't struggling financially, and she had had no recent deaths in her family. The reason that I've just gone through those is they look for markers, and the markers aren't actually there for her. That doesn't mean it is not possible to have an onset of postpartum depression or psychosis when you've never had any of the warning signs or the attributes that are expected to be seen in the background of somebody who is suffering from it do not exist. It is absolutely possible. My own experience of my father with psychosis is you can be the happiest, healthiest human being in the world with the best life and the most joyful world around you and you can still find yourself in the absolute dire straits of psychosis and that can be a terminal experience as it was with my dad. Also, she was not depressed, apparently. She wasn't overwhelmed. She had absolutely no history of marital problems. Bear in mind, she'd been on the phone to her husband for an hour and it was really normal. They chatted brilliantly. They had a close relationship. She had no domestic violence in her life. She had no mental illness. And all of these, again, are factors that we often say play out when somebody is suffering from postpartum psychosis or depression. Just wanna caveat that and say, I know, a lot of you will have suffered from postpartum depression and have had a brilliant life, a brilliant family, and absolutely no warning signs that this was ever gonna to happen to you. But we're just gonna go for the more stereotypical likelihood because in a court and where experts are looking into this, that's what they are looking for. Also, the bit about the demon, because a lot of people will be like, well, Emma, she was seeing a demon outside her window. Now that could most definitely have been associated with a visual hallucination, which is absolutely contextual with postpartum psychosis. And any kind of psychosis, my father saw, heard, smelt things that were not real. They were not there. But to him, oh my God, it's as real as me holding up my hand right now. And people don't connect with that. They don't get it. They think that maybe it would seem something that was non-reality based and it's kind of something that's blurred or unusual and people can't make it. No, it's absolutely, it's in the room with you. It's in the room with you. So that is possible. That plays out in postpartum psychosis. And the truth is, one of the problems that you would say about that particular visual potential hallucination is, when somebody is suffering with psychosis, it doesn't just occur one day and then it's gone the next. It's something that creeps up 
a lot of the time and often it's the people around you that will start noticing because for a while for the person suffering from it it's like this isn't real this can't be real what am i seeing it gets very very scary and then they may start to act in ways that the family start to recognize are notable but it hasn't played out like that for her and her family would likely have noticed the fact that she was seeing these things constantly or enduring these kind of hallucinations. So that kind of plays in more to the, well, it was just more of a cultural explanation for what her episodes were being described by. But obviously that did happen. She did say that and only she knows really whether she was experiencing something that was very visual or something that was more of an emotional connection with her episodes of her particular problem. Now the trial commences August 2015 and the defense of course they claim listen she did kill her daughter absolutely she did but you have to remember she was in an unconscious postical state that's what she was going through this postical state which was following the procedure so you can't hold her responsible and accountable for these actions she did not intend any of this to play out of course the prosecution are like hell no she was left for 11 minutes during that tiny frame of time she's with mirabelle alone she consciously puts that baby in the microwave she knows what she's doing and they said that if there were any chance that a medical condition was behind her that even if they were going to stretch their imagination to the perspective where it was possible that there was something physiologically going on, they would say it was postpartum depression or psychosis rather than a seizure. So the prosecution are basically saying there's no apparent motive for this crime aside from the fact that Mirabella had basically been fussy and crying and that she'd interfered with Yang's work. So Yang had basically cooked her alive on a high heat like a piece of meat. Very, very emotionally compelling for the jury to hear that, isn't it? Can you imagine a baby's life ending in that way and being described in such a manner? And again, the jury are trying to figure out how the hell does a mother who's apparently loving end up doing this? It's really difficult to stretch your imagination to a point where you can contemplate it was something that happened because of a physiological issue. So we get to November 2015. After a three-week trial, the jury reject Yang's claims that she'd put Mirabelle in the microwave during an epileptic seizure. So after a day of deliberation, they find her guilty of first-degree murder and also of assault on a child causing great bodily injury leading to death. So as far as they're concerned, they've got a bang to rights. They genuinely believe that this was something intentional. She was not having an epileptic seizure. She was not struggling even with her mental health. What she was doing was getting annoyed with a little baby girl who was being fussy and crying and she decided to end that little girl's life because of that. It doesn't really sit that well with me, I'll be honest. And I come down really hard on child murderers because they are the most despicable human beings I think exist. But when I think about how Yang has been in the past with her children, there's been literally no episodes of violence. She's not somebody who has displayed any problematic behavior before. It feels a little bit out of the realms of reality and ration for me to see somebody snap in this way. I do appreciate people do snap, I really do. But like I said, only a short while earlier, she'd been tending to a little girl and also trying to protect a little girl from her, shall we say, more rough and tumble sibling. But I wasn't there to listen. There was obviously a compelling argument that meant that they felt they needed to find her guilty. And I'm certainly not defending any actions that involve child death. As you all know, my obsession is the safeguarding of kids. But I always like things to at least have a sense of logic and linearity, and I'm struggling a little bit with this one. So we get to December 2015. What is positive is that Yang actually avoids the death penalty. She's 34 at this point, but she does get sentenced to 26 years to life imprisonment. But 
this isn't the end of the case, guys. So as far as the jury are concerned, she might get 26 years, she might spend the rest of her life in prison, but the system isn't finished just yet. Because in July 2021, in a very dramatic twist, Yang's murder conviction gets reversed on appeal. And the reason for that is due to the improper admission of medical evidence of the original trial. So Mirabel's paediatrician had actually testified on postpartum mental disorders, but they testified on this despite the fact that there was no factual evidence for any of that to be adduced because Yang had already been screened as negative for any such disorder by the very same paediatrician. And like it or otherwise, if somebody has stood there and given evidence that is relatively incriminating potentially about the potential of this individual acting in a certain way, but they have a knowledge that that person has not been suffering from that because they screen them, that is problematic. And again, I'm not even having a go at the paediatrician because if you're asked to give witness testimony to explain a certain situation, you've been dealing with a particular patient, then you probably aren't gonna be a fay with the law and the ramifications of that law should you have already discovered that the individual has screened negatively for these conditions. But for the appeal court, that means that the jury could have been influenced very unfairly by that information. And unfortunately that could lead to a potential miscarriage of justice. So that causes for a retrial. That doesn't mean that the actual reality of how that plays out will be different, but it means that they have to explore the evidence in a different way. Now, the only victim in this is that little girl. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Mirabelle is the only victim. Of course, the family members who adore her, they are also affected, they are also victims, but they are not the victim. That's a little girl who met her life in the most grotesque, despicable, and totally agonizing way. But the case itself is one I've covered because I'm conflicted. It's really tragic. It's really bizarre. And by all accounts, from what I can understand, Yang loved and cherished her baby daughter. She was known to be a really soft-spoken, gentle lady. She didn't have any previous criminal history. She'd never been in trouble with child abuse claims. And it's actually really resonant of a similar case that happened in 1999. 19-year-old Elizabeth Renee Oates she actually avoided a murder trial and then took a plea deal. And her plea was to say that she was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And the reason for this is that she put her one month old son, Joseph, into the microwave. Then she switched it on and she went to bed. And they believe that he died after 10 minutes in the oven. His body temperature reached 106 degrees. But Otty actually suffered from epilepsy. And she said, I don't have any memory whatsoever. I took Joseph into the living room, I fed him, and that's all I remember. Now she received five years. And again, I'm sure that was speculation and suspicion that she got off lightly. But equally, if your brain misfires and you genuinely do act in this way when you have no control, can you imagine firstly losing a child and then being in prison for it? and then the reputational harm that people will project on you because nobody is gonna trust somebody who microwaves their baby, no matter what the circumstances. You know, on one hand, we know the baby has died in the most horrific way. And instinctually, that makes me want people to be punished. But on the other hand, and I suppose when I don my more professional hat, it could genuinely be a case of genuine illness, which has led to this horrifically tragic outcome. And in that case, you have to have some sympathy, if not a huge amount of sympathy for the mother. Now at present, Yang remains incarcerated. Now we have to presume that following the appeals court's decision, there's gonna be a retrial. So watch this space because I don't know how the outcome of that retrial is going to be. 
but certainly it could mean that yang is somebody who experiences a reduced sentence or even potentially walks free. But of course, it could mean that her sentence is even increased. A retrial isn't a safe space. And when the wheels of justice have turned, often getting them put in reverse is almost impossible. And like I said, I don't know. I can't say whether she's guilty or innocent. And certainly a jury did not believe her. But equally, if she is innocent, if she did come round after an episode, and if she is an individual grieving the loss of her child and the separation from her children, it must be an absolutely challenging experience to wake up every single day knowing that that's your new life. And if that is the case, we have to hope that when they look at this case again, maybe she's afforded the leniency that she potentially deserves or not. Let me know your thoughts, let me know your feelings. For Mirabelle, can't even begin to express how sad it makes me feel. I love babies, I love children. I know all of you who come on here specifically have a real connection with kids. I know that we're always blown away and blindsided when a child dies and to die in this way, it's the stuff of nightmares. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know your comments. You might completely disagree with my somewhat empathic representation here. You may fully think that the jury have got it right and that she needs to burn in hell. Let me know. I'd be really interested to gauge your feeling. Take care guys. Be safe. And this is definitely dedicated to Mirabelle, a gorgeous little girl who should be living her life freely and safely and who sadly had that denied. See you next time.